Hi everyone, welcome to my talk on solving the Iconal equation using physics and form neural networks. In this talk, we will see how we can use neural networks to solve a partial differential equation. And in particular, we'll be talking about the Iconal equation. We will also see what are the advantages of doing so compared to the conventional numerical methods. So there is no doubt that deep learning is fast emerging as a potential disruptive, disruptive tool to tackle long-standing research problems. Moreover, recent advances in the field of scientific machine learning have demonstrated a largely untapped potential of deep learning to solve uh, partial differential equations. Um, it, it is to be noted that the idea to use neural networks has been around since the 90s. However, due to recent advances in the theory of deep learning, coupled with a massive increase in computational power and efficient graph-based implementation of new algorithms such as automatic differentiation, we are seeing uh, a resurgence of interest in using neural networks to approximate solution of PDEs. Uh, recently, Maziar Raisi et al. proposed a deep learning framework by the name of physics informed neural networks to solve partial differential equations. And since then, several applications of PINs have emerged uh, solving a multitude of uh, PDEs across science and engineering disciplines. Now, the iconal equation arises in many areas of science and engineering. In robotics, for example, it is used for path planning and navigation. It is also used in semiconductor manufacturing, image segmentation, uh, etc. However, in seismology, iconal equation regulates seismic wave travel times, which is needed for several applications, including travel time tomography, micro seismic source localization, among, among several others. Uh, and the most popular algorithms to solve the iconal equation numerically are the fast marching method and the fast sweeping method. Now, the problem with these methods is that there is no transfer of information between uh, one instance of solution and the other. For example, if you're solving for a particular velocity model, and when you have an updated velocity model, you need to do the same amount of computation, and there is no uh, transfer of information. Uh, likewise, if you have different source positions. Uh, therefore, these methods may result in computational bottleneck when repeated computations are needed, uh, for instance, in the case of uh, structure inversion or location inversion. And therefore, we look at the machine learning literature to see if we could uh, somehow benefit from the advances in machine learning to solve this issue. Now, to uh, fully understand how an iconal equation can be solved using uh, neural networks, we have to understand uh, first a few ideas around it. And once we have these pieces of the puzzle, we can put these pieces together and, uh, and try to really understand how this could be done. Of course, the first thing that we need here is the iconal equation. Uh, here we have the iconal equation for the isotropic case for simplicity of illustration. Actually, we can add an isotropy and or attenuation. Um, the rest of the process will stay the same, only uh, the equation will be a little more complicated, right? Uh, now, here is the isotropic iconal equation, and what we're looking for is the unknown travel time, capital T. Uh, we have boundary condition that says that the travel time at the source location is equal to zero. And V here denotes the, the phase velocity. Now, instead of solving the original iconal equation that we saw, um, we kind of uh, realized that it's better to solve the factored iconal equation because of better convergence properties for the neural network. Therefore, what we do is we, um, we split the unknown travel time, capital T, into two multiplicative factors, capital T sub zero and tau. Um, and we say that, or we assume that capital T sub zero is the known factor and tau is the unknown factor. Once we plug this into the original iconal equation, we get a slightly more complicated iconal equation to solve for, and this is known as the factored iconal equation. And we have a slightly modified uh, boundary condition. Now this is in terms of the unknown travel time factor tau. Now this factor T0 is actually this travel time solution in a homogeneous medium, uh, and the velocity of the medium is taken to be the velocity at the source location. Uh, this results in a very smooth update or a relatively smooth update uh, rather for the for the unknown factor tau compared to capital T, which makes it easier for the neural network to be trained. All right, so the second thing we need is a feed forward neural network, which is a set of neurons organized in layers and in which evaluations are performed sequentially through the layers. So essentially what we need is a neural network with two inputs at least. So if you have a 2D medium, you need two inputs, uh, one for each spatial coordinate X and Z. Of course, if you're talking about 3D medium, we'll have three input coordinates. 
and we will have one output a neuron for this neural network corresponding to the unknown travel time t. So what we essentially want is we feed the coordinates to the neural network and it spits out the unknown travel time capital tau. And we have a bunch of hidden layers as well, uh, which is a problem dependent thing and will depend on how complicated uh, the function tau is that we're solving for. So the next thing uh, that we need to understand is, is, is really the question, why can we hope that a neural network can learn this mapping uh, from input coordinates to this unknown travel time tau? Now this is thanks to the universal approximation theorem, which says that a neural network with a single hidden layer and a finite number of neurons can represent any bounded continuous function. And while this may be true in theory, in practice, it is often very hard to find this optimal set of uh, neural network parameters uh, that can solve a very complicated function. Nevertheless, what we're hoping for here is that once uh, is, is that once we are done with the training process of the neural network, that somehow if we input the coordinates of, at a certain uh, certain coordinates in the computational domain like x and z, we get a travel time function tau. Uh, so the neural network is kind of an approximation of this mapping uh, between coordinates and the and unknown travel time. Now to make this happen, we also need derivatives of the network's output with respect to the input. And there are many ways actually to compute those derivatives. Um, uh, and, and they can be done using symbolic differentiation or finite difference approximations. Uh, however, we use something called algorithmic or automatic differentiation. It uses exact expressions with floating point values instead of symbolic strings and involves no approximation error. And thankfully, many existing computational frameworks have made available efficiently implemented automatic differentiation libraries. And those of you familiar with neural network training would know backpropagation, which is a generalized technique of automatic differentiation. Now, uh, now we come down to you know, combining all of those pieces of the puzzle and seeing how can we solve the iconal equation. Um, so what we need is a loss function here to train our neural network. And the loss function is formed uh, using three terms here. So let's unpack these terms. So the first term here is, um, is trying to minimize the residual of the, of the residual of the underlying partial differential equation. So as you see here, this is the residual of the factored iconal equation. The second term is trying to impose the positivity of the solution, that is tau has to be positive, so we don't want any solution, right, that minimizes um, the residual of the iconal equation, we want only positive solutions, and also the, the solution in the boundary should be equal to one. Therefore, it all boils down to a minimization problem here, in which we try to minimize this loss function j at a bunch of collocation points x star. So we'll select a few points, a few uh, lo spatial locations in our computational domain, and we try to minimize this loss function j here. And we try to find uh, the optimal weights of the network represented by theta here. So this is essentially what we are looking for. So just to summarize everything uh, through this workflow shown here, um, I think one of the questions that still uh, might not be clear to some is that, uh, you're training a neural network, but where is the where is the training set? Where is the label set, right? Um, and, and therefore, it is important to understand that this is a different way of training. We are guiding the training process through the loss function, and we don't have uh, we don't choose any label set here. So there is no need for labeling in this uh, in this algorithm. So essentially, um, what happens is. Uh, you start with a randomly initialized neural network and you input a bunch of collocation points x star z star from your within your computational domain. Now, what do we expect as output? We expect garbage as output because this is a randomly initialized neural network. So the tau that we get out uh, initially is just total garbage, right? And then we use uh, the loss function to calculate the, the misfit uh, between, between what we have here and uh, using the, the, the loss function that we have, right? And then we try to minimize this loss function. So essentially we ask the neural network to go back and update the weights such that this loss function J is, is minimized. And at this point, we need additional inputs such as the known travel time factor T0 and its spatial derivative and also the velocity. So once we have these parameters inputted to this um, optimization engine, 
uh, we kind of uh, go back and forth in neural network, try to update the weights and biases um, until this loss function is minimized. And at that point, we can say that our neural network has been trained, and now we can take uh, spatial coordinates corresponding to a regular grid X and C, feed them to the trained neural network, and we get uh, uh, the mapping travel uh, unknown travel time factor on those uh, spatial locations. We then multiply it with uh, capital T sub zero, which is a known travel time part to get our travel time estimate. So essentially this is the whole process, how it works. Again, there, there is no labeled set here needed. So there is no you know, uh, need to generate a label set or data for training. All right, so let's see how this method performs when we compare it against a popular uh, conventional method known as the fast marching method. So the first thing we look at here is a vertically varying velocity model. We have uh, the source location here at the center of the model indicated by this black star. The velocity goes from two kilometers per second, the surface to three kilometers per second at a depth of two kilometers. What you see here are travel time errors on the left for the physics informed neural network and the right for the fast marching method. What we see here on the left are significantly less errors than the fast marching method. Um, and despite uh, having used only 20% of the grid points that were used to calculate the fast marching solution, um, and therefore we train on only 20% of the total grid points which were randomly selected. And therefore we also see kind of a smooth distribution of uh, errors, which is also kind of random. Um, and then we also don't see any footprint of the grid, which we clearly see here uh, that the errors are increasing diagonally to the to the grid, which is of course common for this fast uh, marching method, using, which is based on, fa uh, on finite difference. Now here are the travel time contours, a red one for the analytical um, solution, um, black for the physics informed neural network and blue for the fast marching. You can clearly see that uh, the red and the black solutions overlap very well compared to the blue one. All right. So having seen that the method works on uh, on the first problem, we now try to see whether uh, having trained one model, can we use that information somehow to speed up convergence on a different model? So this is known as transferred learning and machine learning, uh, which is a technique of uh, using some knowledge gained by solving one problem and using that knowledge to improve uh, our uh, convergence speed in a different, different problem. All right, so what we do is we kind of introduce lateral gradient in the model uh, that we saw earlier, and we also switch the source location to this point here. And what we're going to, going to do is we are going to start now with the model that we trained in the previous case and try to train the neural network. Okay, so what we have here uh, is a convergence history. So on the vertical axis, we have how the law is, is the loss. And we see here how the loss changes as a function of the number of epochs. Um, the blue one is when we initialized the neural network randomly, which is the case we saw earlier with the vertically varying velocity model. So it took plenty of epochs to converge, whereas um, even though we changed the velocity model here significantly, and also the source location, uh, having started with the already trained model, this converges much faster. In fact, it takes about 25% of the effort that was needed earlier. So this is a feature that is not present in conventional numerical uh, methods. And therefore, this is quite encouraging and can be used to speed up computations. All right, so does that result in, in, in less accuracy? Actually not. So despite using transfer learning, we see on the left that the errors for physics and for neural network are significantly less than the fast marching me method, which we see on the right. And this is confirmed by looking at the contours again. All right, uh, now we move to another thing. How can we further improve uh, the speed up uh, of, of our solution? So this, is, uh, this can be done through surrogate modeling. So the idea here is that once you have uh, computed solutions uh, for a number of sources in your models, oftentimes if you're doing uh, micro seismic source localization, you need to compute solutions corresponding to hundreds or thousands of, of source locations. Therefore, if you have computed solutions corresponding to a few sources that are uh, sort of evenly spaced in the domain, uh, then what you could do is you could also introduce the source location as uh, the input parameters. And then your neural network will learn the mapping uh, between the, the source location and 
the corresponding travel time field as well. So what happens then is then when you want to compute solution for a new travel time, uh, for, for a new source location, for example, here somewhere, then it will call on that information based on that training and it will automatically spit out the solution. So essentially from here on, we don't need any training. So it's essentially is like an analytical formula. So having computed a few solutions and then we retrain the model used by introducing the, the, so, the source locations also as input parameters, we can build a surrogate model and then for a new source location, for example, a randomly chosen source location here, what we see is that there's no need for training. It's like just a single forward pass and we, we get our solution. So this can speed up uh, the, the solution dramatically. And again, such a possibility does not exist with conventional numerical techniques. And again, the solution is generally uh, significantly more accurate than the fast margin method, uh, despite we've used almost no computational effort in this case, once the training has been completed. And this is confirmed by using, uh, by seeing at the travel time contours. All right, so, so far we've only seen uh, smooth velocity models. What happens when we have sharp heterogeneities, such as here for the Marmosi model case, again, we have the source indicated by the black star. Uh, we again see um, low travel time errors compared to the fast marching method here, although we see some regions where we have uh, where we have large errors and the method struggles really to obtain as high accuracy as we saw in the previous case. So this is one of the features that we found with the method is that when we have sharp heterogeneities in the model, uh, it tends to struggle and it takes a, a lot more time to converge the solution. So this is something um, that needs to be worked on and that needs uh, a feature that needs to be improved for the metal that is for the method that is to be to deal with uh, heterogeneity, sharp heterogeneities in the model. Again, with travel time contours, it clearly shows that there is significant improvement in accuracy compared to the fast marching method, although there are a few locations which signal the loss in accuracy compared to uh, the previous cases when we were using only smooth velocity models. All right, to bring this to a close here, uh, what we've done is we've demonstrated the use of neural networks to solve the factored iconal equation. Uh, and we are not restricted to the isotropic case. Actually, we can use an isotropy. Uh, we can use attenuation. Uh, essentially, all the, the thing that changes is that you have to update the loss function with uh, the residual of the underlying partial differential equation. The method is mesh-free and can be used to solve PDEs using randomly selected points in the computational domain. And therefore, we can also handle topography very easily. Um, and, and just as I said, more complicated iconal equations can be easily incorporated just by updating the loss function. And as we saw, the perhaps the most important feature is that by using transfer learning and then surrogate modeling, and in fact, by combining these two techniques, we can speed up uh, the speed of computations compared to conventional methods uh, by, by a lot, actually. Uh, another advantage in terms of uh, the actual coding is that uh, this method allows easy deployment of computations across a variety of platforms, whether it's CPU, GPU, essentially it's the same code because it's based on TensorFlow, which is based on, um, on computational graphs. And therefore you don't have to uh, write separate codes, for example, for GPU or CPU. Whereas if you want to implement fast marching or fast sweeping, you would need to, uh, need to you know, uh, rewrite those codes. However, there are a few challenges, and I think these need to be addressed in future studies. One of them is sharp heterogeneities in the model. That is, what do you do? How do you improve uh, convergence when you, when you have sharp heterogeneities? And this is something that needs to be further studied, and there is a lot of parameters uh, in the neural network that needs to be selected. So far, we did, the, we did selected those parameters empirically, but I think there should be a way, uh, there should be a better way for automated selection or semi-automated selection of such parameters. All right, with that, I would like to thank you all for your attention. Feel free to contact me if you have additional questions or comments regarding the presentation. I'll be happy to answer your questions here. Uh, I would like to draw your attention to another presentation on the topic by Professor Tariq Al Khalifa, uh, which will be dealing with the Helmholtz equation. Once again, thank you all for your attention.